chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. Again, that is Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. And it reads, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus at the table in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair and her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know how to do and what manner of a woman this is who is touching him, for she is in sin. She is a sin. I was read to you Luke chapter 7, verses 36 39. Let us stand in that prayer. There is beyond the age of blue a God concealed from him inside. Start us out on another day journey. Thanks. While the blood still running warm in our veins. 
Father, it's all about you, Father. Yes. It's not about me. Amen. Touch our medication before it enters our body. Yes. We pray that they do the job it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. That is, if it's your will. Amen. And all these blessings, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 205. 205. This life is filled with sorrow and trouble. Promise. 
fragrant oil, what I was going to say is, she begins to anoint his feet. So the Pharisee who apparently way happy to see this uninvited woman in his house. And as we keep reading, we find that he begins reasoning in his own mind, and basically call this, he started talking to himself. And he concluded that Jesus could not be who he thought he was. Jesus can't be a prophet. Because if Jesus was a prophet, he would have known who this woman really was. Therefore, if Jesus knew what type of woman she was, he would not let this woman do what she was doing for him. Y'all know the story, right? Then it goes a little bit further. So Jesus then knows what this man is thinking. Jesus then gives a parable of the two debtors, verses 40 through 43. In the parable, he's basically explaining that our awareness of our spiritual condition is tied to our actions and our behavior. Paul even talks about this same thing. When you understand, he talks about the mercies of God. When you understand God's grace and his mercy, it then will come out in your behavior because you appreciate what God has done. So our affection or our love is driven by our faith and our gratitude. It's, it's like when it's, you give a child what he wants and he's grateful, he'll love all along. You can beat that behind, but he still loves you because you continue to give them what they want and what they need. So in other words, the, the, the parable is kind of saying how much we love Jesus is determined by how much we understand how much we have been forgiven. Let me say that again because somebody missed that. If you stop and think about what God has forgiven all your sorrowness, what you've done before, that ought to make you appreciate and thank him for all that he's forgiven you. Yes. Now, in order for Jesus to get you forgiven, he had to die for you. That ought to make some folk not only rejoice, but sometimes you ought to cry for what the God did for you. Yeah. He actually died for me. Amen. And some of us, if, we, if, we, if we're really honest, we can look back in our closet, see that skeleton, a few of them that we've cut, a few of them that we've murdered, a few of them that we've talked about, a few of them that we've gossiped. And he said, before then, all that stuff you did before, I'm going to clean your closet out. It doesn't even exist anymore. So, this woman, her affection because she knew that she had to get to Jesus. Uh -huh. And Jesus forgave her of all her sins. So Jesus gives a parable, and then Jesus applies the parable to Simon, the Pharisee, and the woman in verses 44 through 47. So this is where Jesus describes how Simon neglected, or some people say refused. Let's just say he refused and he was neglectful. To give Jesus what's called the customary greeting and the hospitality of that day as his guest when he came into his house. Finally, verse 48 through 50. Jesus says to the woman, oh, finally in verse 48 through 50, by what Jesus, because I was getting ready to read it, but you read it 48 through 50, by what Jesus says to the woman, he's indicated to all that there are listening. I'm the Messiah, and I have the authority to forgive all sins. So why the man wanted Jesus there is irrelevant. The point is, the man invited Jesus to come, and he treated Jesus like a real head stepchild. Because he didn't do what he was supposed to do when he came in the house. So you're about to follow that, right? So, that being said, well, I have to give some background com uh, commentaries about the custom of the day, so this will make even more sense. We know it at, at that day, during certain events, when a Pharisee or somebody invites a, we'll say a speaker over, um, the guest was supposed to be, when he walked through the door, greeted with a kiss. Then, while they're there, they're supposed to give them some ointment so they can anoint their, um, anoint their head. Because when people travel, they had dusty feet and dusty hair. So he was supposed to be then given 
water or slaves come in and wash your feet. This was the norm. That's like saying if someone comes to your house, you invite them, would you like something to drink? Would you like something to eat? That's customary. Don't invite me to your house and you ain't got nothing for me to eat. Well, we're going to have a Bible study. Well, I'm hungry. Don't have me talking about let's do 7 o'clock. No, it's close to my bedtime. time. You're going to bring me early? Feed me, Seymour. I'm just talking about it. Get back. But I'm saying there's some things that we should do that's expected of you. Keep that in mind because we're going to get a little bit deeper. So it was also the custom that during that time that they had meeting like that, they would let visitors come into the home. So now we have Jesus and this man and his disciples now having a meeting. But when you have this thing, you can allow visitors to come in, but they had to come in and they had to sit against the wall. So they could not interrupt the dialogue, but they were allowed to sit and listen to the dialogue. Y'all follow what I'm saying now? So in other words, if it was me and Jimmy having a seat talking right here, y'all can come in and sit around, but you ain't supposed to say anything. Because they were consigned, uh, confined to stay to the wall and listen to the dialogue so you can learn something. And at this type of event, the host was under no obligation to uh, give those customary greetings to the visitors. Y'all follow what I'm saying? If I can, he invited him, he's supposed to kiss him, give him an ointment off for his head, and wash his feet. But visitors, you don't have to do that because they don't have to. They're uninvited guests, but you can still come in. So if we understand that, they were uninvited, but they just had to sit there with dirty feet, dusty hair, feet, and no kicks when they walked in the door. So as we look more into the story, you will notice that in the story, who is it addressing? Oh, let me flip it. I'm going to ask you. If you notice the story, it's not addressing everyone that was in the house, right? It's only addressing the man and how he acted toward this woman. We're not talking about what everybody else might have done. Right now, Jesus is saying, I'm dealing with the host of the house. And how him being a religious person, a Pharisee, behaved toward Jesus and how he behaved toward this woman who entered into his house, who he labeled a sinner, and we find out she was a visitor too. Here we go. So subsequently, this lesson is not directed to the church as a whole. Keep this in mind. I'm not addressing everybody, but I'm rather addressing the individual church members' behavior. When a person shows up unannounced and technically unexpected to our assembly and worship. All right. When they show up at our Bible study. Or when they show up when we have in our uh, feast day meetings. We're talking about people that we did not, or we should say, they came unexpected and we weren't expecting them to be here. Everybody still following what I'm saying? Because when we get the story, this all will make sense. So, I also want you to see another comparison. Something that's really, it just stands out and most of us missed it, but that's a comparison and a contrast in the story. Jesus is a guest, right? But this woman is a visitor. We're on the same page. If you think about what I just said, don't that sound weird? I'm saying Jesus is a guest, she's a visitor. It, they ain't the same thing. Here's why. They have similarities in its meaning, but they ain't the same thing. I didn't think we were saying ain't. They are not the same thing. Let me explain to you the reason why. Definition of a guest. A guest is defined or inferred as a person who is invited to visit your home. Or a person that's uh, asked to partake in a function, to partake in a gathering, as a person's companion, as a person's friend, or as a person's family. Friend, family, companion. Yeah. So in other words, when you invite your friend, come on, go to church with me. You're the host. You are inviting them to your worship. That makes them a guest, right? Let, let me make sure it makes sense. Let's say Tim had a party. I'm being messy. 
Matter of fact, I use who I always use. Let's say Jimmy had a Paul. And Jimmy invited me to come to the party. Mm -hmm. yeah. I show up. By definition, what does they make me at the party? Yes. A guest. Now, by definition of what a visitor is, it's defined or referred as a person such as a tourist. People come. They don't announce, oh, by the way, uh, Grand Canyon, I'm coming. They're unannounced. They're uninvited. So a visitor is a person that's uninvited person who comes to a place, a function, or a gathering. And when they get there, they're considered a foreigner or a stranger. Right. Y'all see the difference? Okay. Jimmy had a birthday party. He didn't invite Katie. <laughs> Katie shows up at the party anyway. By definition, what does that make Katie? A visitor. So somebody know what I'm talking about. She ain't a guest because she's uninvited and unexpected. Y'all know that would be some mess, right? Okay. I can see Katie now the green machine with tails and stuff. That ain't that but if you think about what I'm saying, subsequently or subconsciously, we know that there's a difference. We just never put it together. Guests are expected. Visitors are unexpected. Guests are prepared for. You prepare for a guest. But you don't really prepare for a visitor. So if I do RSVP and I know 20 people are coming, the 21st first person ain't going to get nothing to eat, they ain't going to get nothing to drink because I have prepared. Y'all see what I'm saying? Okay, now. Guests are engaged. You, you, when you have a guest, you sit down and you talk with them because you know you invite them. But visitors are tolerated. Katie showed up. I ain't gonna have to come. I ain't going. But you know, Katie, can I get some of you? What you want? Now, with that being said, visitors, I'm sorry, guests are expected to return. You're my guest, you know, hey, I brought you a church. Hey, would you come back with me next time? But visitors are expected to leave. Y'all ever thought about that? If somebody, if my party, you came, you was uninvited, mm -hmm. I can't wait till you leave. <laughs> Guests, visitors, y'all follow what I'm saying? Yes. So with that being said, you maybe understand why I'm saying that there's a difference being a guest and being a visitor. Yeah. And if you, it's, it, it's, when you use the words in the same sentence, I'm going to show you something that we've done and I've done and I realize, I said, oh Lord, i got to change it. But when you use visitor and guest in the same sentence, it's actually contradicting itself. It's what we, I like to call an oxymoron. Don't ask me how to spell it, but it's an ox, more, and a ron, something like that. <laughs> when you go to another congregation, let's say you go to hell, and they got um, a, a bulletin, right? And when you open the bulletin, you ever notice, they may not see it, I'm just using their name. Right up there it says, to our visitors. You are our honored guest. Y'all see the oxymoron in that? Which means it's literally saying, now the reason why I have to say that is because I realize that's what I put in our bulletin in the day. But to the unexpected, to the uninvited foreigners and strangers, you are our honored and invited and expected friends and family. Y'all see that don't make sense? But we use that. Now, what I'm trying to make sure you understand. Let me be clear. So what I'm about to say, but watch, say you can't say this. There's nothing wrong with the use of the word visitor. Nothing wrong. But I'm trying to show you something by things that we say, we don't realize what we're actually saying. Well, you're being technical. That's what I need to be. So we can be mindful of a visitor and a guest. Because sometimes we treat our guests as visitors. It'll make sense in a minute. The definition of visitor and guest, similar, but they're not the same thing. Now, if I keep this in your head, everything's going to make sense when we get into the text. So I want you to think about it for a moment. As members of the Church of Christ, don't we or do, do we or do we not make it clear that we have an open invitation for everybody and all to come worship with us every Lord's Day? 
or we'll say every time the church door is open. Am I right? So if the answer is yes, then when folks come to 212 Ellis Street, are they visitors or are they guests? I won't definitely make much more sense. The reason why I'm asking this question is because I have personally experienced and that I've seen where individual religious folk, consciously or unconsciously, meaning knowingly or unknowingly, make this distinction by their actions when I walked into the church building. I came in, they said, we're open to all. I came in as if I was trying to be a guest. But the way they looked at me, unexpected, unwanted, I had to be a visitor. Y'all see what I'm saying? Which brings us to the subject, verse um, 36. Keep that in mind. When one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, he went to the Pharisee's house, sat down and ate. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And when she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Verse number 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him, he's a guest now, saw this, he spoke within himself, saying, this man. When people are mad at you, they don't call you by your name. Why didn't he say, Jesus? And he went, no, this man. You know how folk do. This man... If he were a prophet, would have would have known who and what manner of woman this is touching him, for she's a sinner. Drop down to verse number 44. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, Jesus now looks at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. I do this a lot. When I'm trying to mess with Katie, I look at Francis and say, green machine, green machine. But she knows who I'm talking about. So Jesus turned to the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered to your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears. And she wiped them with the hair of her head. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman has not stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. So I want you to consider for a subject. How do they view you after they view you, viewing them. Let me say this to make sure again. How do they view you after they view you, viewing them? Here's what I'm trying to explain. How does a person who comes into our assembly on Sunday or Wednesday night view or assess how you assess them? After they see you checking them out, or look at them up and down once they walk to the church building. Oh, we ain't thought about that, huh? All right. And we know good and well, because in Clio, I have to bring up some old stuff. I had an issue with folks turning around when folks came into the building. The doors didn't make enough noise for them to turn around. But there's some people that can sit in a certain spot and hear an ant walk on water. There's some people that can't hear nobody talking about you, can't hear it rattling in the car, but they'll hear somebody, somebody just pulled up. <laughs> they driving on grass. Anyway, keep moving right along. <laughs> the question should be, how do you think this woman felt in this story? Think about what I'm asking. This woman knows she was a sinner. Folks knew who she was, and she walks in. And how do you think folks looked at her when she walked in? Unlike the picture where you, um, a Da Vinci had did this thing up where he got Jesus sitting in a chair at the center of a table. And um, Jesus, and you got him sitting in a chair. Jesus didn't sit in a chair and then have folk this way. The way it was done was it was made in a U. Not University of Miami, the U. It was in a U. And Jesus 
If this is the beginning of the U, Jesus would have sat on the left-hand corner of, uh, of the table, or we'll say the surrounding. And the reason why they did that so service could come in the middle and serve them. The Jesus would sit there, and then the host would sit on the other end. So guess who were always looking at one another? The host was always looking at the guests. So they were looking at each other. So understand that. Y'all got that in your mind. So that being said, we now have Jesus sitting, not on the table, laid out, but Jesus sitting in the U. He's reclining on that side on his left elbow on the floor with his feet behind him. They weren't sitting in no chair back then. Yeah, Jesus was talking, but he wasn't thinking about no chair. He had no lazy boy sit back, feet go up. No, the under that. The stuff you see on there, it ain't how it was. So as Jesus being the honored guest sitting on the left, the far right would have been your boy, your, the host. So in verse number 38, when we read, where the woman stood behind Jesus at his feet, that means while Jesus was laying on the floor, sideways eating, everybody saw this woman. The guy that was looking, so if Jesus is right him, I'm laying down, it's like the Mariah was standing here, I'm standing over her. Y'all know good and well, you're going to see me come behind her. So he's standing there. Do you think that woman and people walked in, hey girl, how you doing? All right now. Y'all know good and well, that ain't how they acted because he made it clear that she was a sinner. So the Pharisees sit directly across from Jesus had to see her. So in verse number 39 where it says, now when the Pharisee who invited Jesus, him, saw him, he spoke to him and said, this man, if he was a prophet, he would have known what type of woman this woman was that was touching him, for she's a sinner. So we know that the Pharisees saw this man, saw this man, this woman, and already deduced who she was by what she used to do. And back then they considered sinners the lowest of the low of the low. So you know good and well he wasn't happy that this woman came to his house. People try to make what she was, she was probably this, probably that. It's irrelevant what her sin was. It's irrelevant, why did he give her a name, what her name was. Here's the reason why. When a visitor, or for a visitor, when someone comes into our worship, that you don't know, does she, that person have a name? Not until you ask what it is. So I want you to see how that's how we are. We don't know anything about that person, but when they walk in, you have to nerve to look at them like they ain't nothing. I'm going to explain to you why that's a problem, but we have to be mindful that I'm sure he wouldn't have in her presence. And there's a pretty good chance when he saw her, he looked her up and down. You know how folk they don't like you? I've seen people do that. I'm thinking if I hit you in your jaw, you won't be looking at all. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, when I first got into church, I had to keep reminding myself, because I'm spiritually saved, you are physically saved. Some of y'all don't understand what I'm saying. Because I'm trying to make it to heaven, I'm not going to put my hands on you. Because folk in the church, I shouldn't say that, religious folk are the worst folk. Not folks that have a, religion, a relationship with Christ, because if you have a relationship with Christ, we already know it's about love, right? But there's a religious folk that will down you because they don't know nothing about you but what they see you wear, how they see your hair. They might not even like the color that you got on today. She don't get aware she shouldn't be wearing that yellow. Now I'm thinking, boy, girl, you better come out there yellow. So it's how people view what they say. And I'm asking somebody because they got them yellow. We wish you no shame. All right. But don't you think this woman, when she came in, that man made her feel uncomfortable? She feel unwelcome there? And would have felt, un it just like, how embarrassing to walk into this church building and folks stare at you when you walk in. What else is that? I seen, uh, Katie, you know that lady back there in the back? Okay, Katie. Now I'm gonna let you know, Katie look back there and know exactly who it is. She didn't think I saw her, but she did. It's like a spider up tape and went, did it again? I was like, oh, Katie, turn around. She in the front row. Don't take it. The point is, she would have felt embarrassed. Didn't know about this probably demand and speak to her, so she was ignored. She would have felt uncomfortable, unwelcome, and most of all, she would have felt humiliated. Think about how people feel when they walk in the door. And you got, you sitting here like this, you look back, 
<laughs> Think about that. I've seen it done. And other times, I mean, I'm serious. When I walked in, I felt like if I just hit him in the back of the head. I'm telling you, I had to just stop. Because I'm thinking, that's, that you can't be more disrespectful than that. I'm not saying that y'all are doing that, but I ain't saying that's a folk that turn around. And they think nobody else saw that. <laughs> so y'all should be the... <laughs> I tell you, I can be mad with some folk. I can't do that with uh, uh, Sister Linda, because she's like, we just know each other. We ain't got but a couple months, and don't come call me on it. In about a year, I got a date We're going on. So y'all see what I'm saying? Y'all agree with me, right, how someone would feel when they came in. Now, the reason oh, I gotta say it. I've been to a lighter skinned congregation. They had the same name that we wear. I walked in, I was out of town. And you y'all know on Sunday I'm gonna look good. I may be ugly, but I look good. I walked in. I wasn't extravagant. I was just calm through with the white thing going across black tie. Walked in, and them folks stared at me like I was a and I'm thinking, y'all just don't look. I'm, okay, I'm visiting. Be cool. Say nothing. I'm not even going to tell you what time or what city or state it is. Uh, but it was like, okay, since y'all think y'all sleep, I'm going to sit almost in the front. So you know me. Like George Jefferson. <laughs> All the way down the middle thinking, y'all looking at me, I'm going to give you something to look at. Now, I'm, I'm trying to help y'all understand. If I had been any other time before then, I would have been human. I would have walked up out of there because of how people looked at me. And I came to have been the second, the second row seat, and it was a person sitting there. And I was like, and I was wrong. That's why I said I was young in the faith. But I was like, you either gonna scoot over or I'm gonna sit next to you. Because the guy looked at me like this, and I'm like, are you gonna move? Or are you gonna scoot over? I come. And you know how you put the behind all in the face? <laughs> I'm telling you, I was saved. I was saved, but I was saved just freshly saved. And I made sure, and I sat there. And the woman sat next to me, she said, how you doing? The only person that asked for, because when at the very end, not only did they not ask for visitors, two people spoke to me and shook my hand on the way out the door. That lady there, and I, for a minute, that's why when y'all give me peppermints, I'm like, are y'all trying to tell me something? I thought she was trying to say, well, your preference like, but she was like, hey, I got some peppermints, would you like some? I think I'm like, is my breath that bad? <laughs> But that's what people do. But I understood how I would have felt, how they made me feel for that brief moment. And again, the old robber stepped in and said, I'm going to show out and show up. But, and you know, if you really want to get them, say amen in the service. Yes, ma'am. I should have said amen every time I got a chance. I ain't been back since, but I did talk to the minister because he didn't even speak to me. And I was leaving, I said, wait a minute. I literally turned around and said, the preacher didn't even speak to me. And you couldn't help but to see me. Because I was the only piece of pepper in a soft fat okay. So I said, hey, how you doing? Did you notice that I was there? Well, yeah. You didn't think you'd speak to me? Well, I thought, no, 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 no. If I was a soul that needed to be saved and didn't know nothing about the church, would I want to come back to this place anymore? No. Be mindful how we treat folk when they come in. Because I have seen how folks come in and be mistreated because of how you view them before you even know them. So, I have this issue about people, and I understand turning around, looking me up and down, and making a disgusted or repulsed look. Uh, um, then turn around and act like they didn't see me. And I'm sure that I'm not the only other person who has walked into a church building. You being your first time visiting there, folk looked at you and looked you up and down when you came in. Like, oh, why is she here? And what's even worse is when folks have homecoming. Do you understand what homecoming is? Folk that are out there coming home? And they will treat them like, what you doing here? It's homecoming. All right. The one time you ought to be happy to see me, they act like the older brother in the story of the two sons. Why he here? That's the wrong type of attitude. So the thing that I, that if you notice the most is that the woman who was deemed a sinner by the Pharisee could have been some other place other than where Jesus was. Y'all got to see where I'm going to go with this right now. She wasn't. She could have been 
out there doing whatever sin that they claimed that she was doing when Jesus was there. But instead, she was where Jesus was and happened to be at the feet of Jesus. So in other words, when someone comes into the Lord's house who may be lost sinner, or someone who don't even know anything about God, or someone that has strayed away from the faith, if they show up in the assembly, that in itself is a reason to be joyful because they could have been out doing what they always do on Saturday. Right. They could have been sleeping because I'm going to let you know the best time to sleep is on Saturday. Because you know you don't work, you don't play hard on Saturday. I know some of y'all don't know nothing about that. You, 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 you did your thing on Friday. So you know you rested a little bit. This is how I used to be. So about 2.33, I would start the, uh, the feeling of the different kind of spirit. About 2, 2.30, because I'd have had lunch and everything's right. So you just do just enough to get you right. So you can act a fool at night. So when the time to wake up on Sunday, by 10.30, 11 o'clock is the time to uh, take my shower and start all over again. Think about the person who walks in here, who we consider sinner, but they could have been any other place, but they right here. Amen. They purposed in their mind to be in the Lord's house instead of at Johnny's house or Erica's house. They want to be in the Lord's house. So we have to understand, stop treating sinners like they're beneath you. Because the problem is, I guarantee you, if we look at some of your past, mm -hmm. if we called up some of your kinfolk, right. I ain't even got to go no further. Y'all follow what I'm saying, right? right. So, yeah. and I stated on before that many sermons that I've said before, that's an expectation that people expect, a behavior that people that expect when they come into the assembly of the Lord's house, right? When y'all come to a certain place, you're expecting a certain thing. And there's an expectation that people expect. But what we forget is, there's an expectation that God expects from us too. So when they walk in, there's an expectation that they're expecting. But don't y'all forget that God, don't y'all forget, have, have you not forgotten that God expects a certain behavior when you're in his house. 